we read together from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3 and verses 20 to 24. After the curse is pronounced upon Satan and upon Adam and Eve, and God warns Adam that from this point onwards it will be by the sweat of your face that you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But then he goes on to say this, the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of God. We pray that he will bless it to us as we consider it together shortly. Continue our studies in the book of Genesis this morning, at least the opening chapters of Genesis, by turning to the passage that we read. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verses 20 to 24. <clears throat> <clears throat> One of the greatest works of literature, uh, not just in the English language, but globally in the literature of the nations through history, is the work entitled Paradise Lost by John Milton. It's certainly regarded as perhaps the greatest piece of writing um, known in the English language. And it is uh, an epic poem, a long poem, uh, that uh, relates the, the biblical account of Adam's fall and the aftermath, the consequences of that act of disobedience and everything to which it led. He wrote a, a sequel to Paradise Lost that isn't perhaps as well known um, as the, uh, the work that has made him famous. Um, and the sequel was entitled Paradise Regained. Uh, that he doesn't leave us in the, the darkness of that good gift that God gave being ruined by man's disobedience and bearing the consequences of that. But he tells us what happens next. He speaks of the grace of God. He speaks of God not being deterred in his original purpose to provide a race, the human race that are his image bearers, designed to bring him glory and honor in the world and indeed throughout the universe. Um, but he speaks of the restoration, that he doesn't abandon them to their ruined condition, but he brings them back to himself. As the title suggests, Milton's concern in this second piece was to explore what was involved in the reversal of Adam's loss and the consequences for the human race thereafter, um, that there would be a, a, a rescue and indeed a renewal that God would bring into the catastrophe into which Adam had been plunged. Interestingly, the focus of Milton in that sequel in Paradise Regained is not what happens in the aftermath in the garden, but he actually focuses um, particularly on Jesus in the wilderness. Uh, because in that very perceptive way, as he looks at what happened when Jesus was taken into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and for 40 nights, um, that what Jesus was doing there was retracing the steps of Adam. Um, Adam uh, was placed in a garden where if he was obedient to the Lord's command, he would be um, blessed with the, the, the Lord making permanent the gift of life that he had given to him and securing a perfect creation forever. 
And so Jesus retraces the steps. Um, and, and, and this time he is walking not in a garden, but in a wilderness. He is surrounded not by tame animals that can be named and controlled. He is um, controlled by wild animals that are a threat to him. Um, he is not there surrounded by an abundance of food that he can enjoy, but he's in a place where, where he is starving because there is nothing there to eat. And he was there to be tempted of the devil. As the devil had sought to undo the first man in the garden, so Satan came and tempted Jesus, not just with the three particular temptations that are recorded for us, but we believe that, that Jesus was constantly being tempted by the devil. The devil knew full well who Jesus was and why he had come, and he was going to do everything in his limited power to try and derail the Messiah on his mission of salvation. But both of these landmark pieces of literature and the esteem by which they have been held through the years, not just by Christians, but even in the secular world, says a lot about how the issues that are recorded for us in these verses in Genesis have an impact upon us all. And if we want to make sense of life, and if we want to find hope in the midst of despair in life, then we need to consider what God is revealing and teaching in this passage. What's so striking, however, is that both of these themes actually converge in this one passage. Despair and hope meet together. And, and, and the instinct um, for us is to, is to focus on what God is doing in these verses, and, and, and rightly so. But actually what is far more telling is what God is not doing in these verses. And, and that is just, as it, if not more edifying than what he is actually doing. And I want to explore four ways in which this stands out in the passage. The first is that God was not abandoning the human race to the awfulness of death, which he could rightly have done. Secondly, he was not giving the human race over to a life of guilt and shame and despair, which again he could rightly have done. Thirdly, he is not condemning the human race to eternity in a ruined world. And then finally, he is not leaving the human race without hope of a future and the promise of salvation. So, so these things that God did not do when he could so rightly have done them tell us a great deal about God and how we understand him and how we relate to him. In the first place then, God is not abandoning the human race, even in its incipient form with just two members of it at that time. He is not abandoning them to the awfulness of death in, in verse 20. <clears throat> at a first glance, what is said in verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, um, leaves us scratching our heads. What, what are we meant to learn from that? Well, how, how does that relate to everything that has just come before? But as we look more closely, we realize that it most certainly has a link to what has come before, because God, in the previous verse, has just pronounced a sentence of judgment on Adam and Eve, and the closing words of that judgment is that he will die. By the sweat of your face you shall, eat, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And it seemed from that pronouncement that God had made in the preceding verses as though this was nothing but divine condemnation coming to bear upon Adam and his wife. And it marked the end of God's purpose for them before it had hardly even begun. Man's fate would be to return to the dust from which he was taken. And yet the very next statement is about life. Death in the one breath and then life in the next. Life. 
Up until this point, it seems as though the woman had not been given a personal name. Um, she, was, she was called woman, for she had been taken out of man. But then again, there's, there's a kind of ambiguity with Adam, um, because the, the, the word Adam we so often take as a personal name, but the word Adam in the Hebrew language is simply the word for the man. The man, Adam, the woman. And the man names his wife and says she should be called Eve because she is the mother of all the living. Forgive the pun, but, but that's, that's a statement that is pregnant with meaning. Um, there's, there's far more tied up with that little statement than, than uh, Adam having a eureka moment. Maybe he's been scratching his head for, 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 for days thinking, what am I going to call this creature that I've been given? And suddenly the lights come on, I'll call her Eve. No, this was a thoughtful process. He was, he was to, just as he was to name the animals under his care, in a very special way, he was to name this, this woman who had been given to him to be a helpmate, to be his companion, to be his encouragement. And he calls her the mother of all Living not just through natural motherhood, because because she would, um, as they, she gave birth to children, um, she gave, she would see grandchildren being born, and and no doubt she lived long enough to see great grandchildren born and perhaps beyond, given the length of time that they lived at the beginning. But the entire room, human race descended from this first pair. And, and even those who are interested in genetics are intrigued by the fact, as you examine the genetics of the human race, despite all the diversity that exists between people in different parts of the world, from different nations and different ethnic backgrounds, there's a commonality um, that goes back, not just, not, that doesn't simply spread throughout those who are living, but it can be traced back through testing the DNA of those who have long since died and find that there's a, a genetic commonality that goes all the way back. <coughs> and indeed, as the Bible tells us, it goes all the way back to the beginning. But there's also the sense in which she, as we see her being brought to salvation after her disobedience in this passage, and in particular, the promise that was given to her that her seed, the seed of the woman, will be the instrument of deliverance that God will bring to the world is a reminder to us that, that from her would descend, would descend a, a savior who would be the great, bring the great reversal of the fall. He would come to redeem. There could be no greater testimony to God's grace and to God's mercy than to have this name applied to this individual. Even though death had indeed already entered the world through Adam's sin, although he was not dead physically, he had died spiritually. And fellowship with God, communion with God, which had been his natural instinct when God made him in perfection, had been exchanged from, for a dread of God and a desire to hide from God. But God was saying, I'm not abandoning you to the awfulness of death in all its different direction, dimensions. Death in its very essence is separation. Is the separation of a person's soul from God by nature in the course of time. That we are born in our trespasses and sins as David. Uh, we are conceived in our, our, our mother's womb in trespass and sins as David reminds us in, in, in the Psalms. Um, and, and in that sense, we are, we are spiritually dead. Um, yes, we, our bodies are fit and healthy and lively, but, but spiritually there's, um, there's, there's, no, there's no oneness with God, no communion with God 
But then when physical death occurs, and it's a mysterious moment to, to watch a last breath being, being drawn, in one sense the body looks exactly the same it was just a few seconds beforehand, but something has changed. Something has changed whenever that final breath is breathed. And it's the separation of the spirit, the soul, from the body. That, that when a person dies, what happens to their souls? Well, if they're a Christian, their souls are taken into the immediate presence of Christ in glory. And together with the spirits of all the righteous made perfect, we surround the, the throne of God and we worship him. But Peter reminds us that for those who do not believe, the spirits of those who are not Christians are taken to that place that the Bible calls hell. And they are kept in the presence of the, the evil spirits who are imprisoned there, waiting for the day of judgment. And it'll be a place of torment. In other words, the torment that awaits those who refuse to bow the knee to King Jesus begins at the moment of their death. That's when they begin to experience the awfulness of hell itself. But of course, the, the final expression and the ultimate expression of death is the second death that the book of Revelation describes when both soul and body are eternally cut off from any, any awareness of God, any nearness of God. They are abandoned to the abyss forever. And, and that simply does not bear thinking about, dear friends. It does not bear thinking about. And even though the doctrine of hell is not a doctrine that is much preached these days from many pulpits, it was Jesus Christ himself who had more to say about hell than anyone in all of Scripture because he himself has experienced it. He descended into hell, the creed reminds us. Adam had experienced death, but only in part. And despite that, he was able to speak of life and the prospect of life. And the grounds for that hope was that God's word and God's promise had already been given, that, that a deliverer would come, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. He saw not just a future on earth, but the, birth of, but the birth of a future deliverer whom God would send. And all of that puts death in perspective. The reality of physical death remains for us as Christians, but it is nothing but the gateway to glory if we are Christians. It is the door by which we leave this fallen, darkened world behind and enter the world of light and life. But it also puts life in perspective. Life in this world provides the opportunity for deliverance from death in the next world. And that's crucial. Absolutely crucial that we should reflect on the brevity of life. One of the, one of the things that um, has often struck me and, and, and I often think about, that the value of having a graveyard beside the church. In, in the churches that I went to as a, a child growing up in Anglicanism, um, it was the norm for churches to have the graveyard there in the church grounds. And it meant that every day that you, you walked to church, every Sunday you came to church, you're walking past headstones, which perhaps in childhood, early on, you didn't know who the people were who were in the ground beneath those, those markers. But as you grew older, you realized you were walking past graves and, and they were fresh graves and you knew exactly who was in that grave. And it was a reminder not merely of their mortality, but our own mortality, that one day it will be our turn to breathe our last, to be laid to rest and to enter into what lies beyond. It reminds us that life is the the opportunity for us to find that deliverance. And the grounds for that hope that we have is the same as Adam, that we have a deliverer. His name is Jesus. 
He's not only been promised, but we live in an age where we know that he has come and he has, he has secured deliverance for us. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He is the only antidote to the last enemy that we all must one day face. But then we see that, that Adam is not, and Eve are not given over to a life of guilt and shame. Next thing we read is that God made garments of skin as coverings for Adam and Eve to cover their guilt, to cover their shame, their own feeble efforts, as we've seen already, to cover themselves, their nakedness with fig leaves was now exchanged for a covering that was provided by God. And it was a sobering experience for Adam and Eve because they find themselves, as they, as they um, wrapped themselves in the covering that wasn't merely covering their, their nakedness of which they were ashamed, but it was, they, were covering, they knew that they were being covered by something that would shield the sight of God from the sin, the contamination that now lay within. But as they reflected upon that, they found themselves looking at something that they had never witnessed before. Even in their brief experience in the Garden of Eden, surrounded by beautiful animals. As they savoured the skins that were wrapped around them, they were looking at the bloodied carcasses of two creatures that died in order that they might be spared. Animals slaughtered by God to cover their guilt. Them for us, they thought. Their guilt, their nakedness, their shame before God and before each other had been dealt with through the death of two animals. And that was a pale anticipation of what God had planned for the way in which salvation would ultimately come. It spelled out previewed in the, the history of Israel of the Old Testament. You read through the history of God's people um, from, from Abraham onwards especially and, and you find that, that ritual sacrifice is the norm. Indeed, ritual carnage on an industrial scale marked the life and the religion of Israel. God's people were to witness the ugliness of sin's consequence seen in the sacrificial cost of securing redemption. In order for God to be both just and the justifier of the ungodly, he had to put someone else in the place of sinners. And God knew, and he was revealing from the very beginning, there could only be one individual who could ever fit that capacity. But he previewed it graphically in the slaughter of animals to make atonement for the sins of people. People knew that it wasn't the animal blood that cleansed them. They knew it was pointed to something infinitely greater. And it leads ultimately to Jesus and to the cross. And his people are meant to gaze upon him in all his nakedness, his shame, his degradation. It was a horrendous sight. And we are meant to gaze upon that. And we are meant to reflect upon that. And we are meant to say, it was, it was meant to be me. But he has taken my place. He has borne my sin. He has, he has taken my guilt. He has paid the penalty. It was all for me that I might be spared. He was given over to guilt and shame in place of his chosen people. So how, how can we find peace in any futile efforts to cover our own sin, our own failure? And why should we even contemplate that? Because God has provided the foolproof covering the covering that comes with a guarantee if we would but look to him in faith and in repentance.
because he has taken away not only the guilt, but also the disgrace that is ours by virtue of our sin and fallenness. God has not condemned the human race to eternity in a ruined world, verses 22 and 23. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, um, <clears throat> knowing good and evil. Um, now let he, lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden to work the ground from which he was taken. God's next action is to banish this couple from the Garden of Eden and to bar them from the way to the tree of life. And there was mercy in that. There was mercy in that. Because if he had eaten from the tree of life um, in his state as it was then, Spoiled by sin, yes, redeemed by grace, but still bearing the marks of sin. He would have been confirmed in that state of having a sinful component in his life. So God sent him out of the garden, away from, from that tree. And in one sense, it was an act of judgment. He was excluded from the place where his relationship with God would otherwise have been consummated. But had he done so in his fallen state, he would have had a miserable existence for all time. It says something about how we conceive of eternal life. If, if, if it amounts only to never-ending existence in a world as we know it, it amounts to a curse and not a blessing. Because this world has been spoiled it has been ruined and it will only be renewed. It will only be purified on the day that Jesus Christ returns. But God spares us from that. Just as Adam and Eve were no longer fit for life in God's paradise because they, they could not abide God's presence any more than God could tolerate theirs with their sinfulness, they were expelled from, from Eden and and. Um, and, and, and they looked forward to the better world that God had indicated he would usher in. One of the most precious threads that runs through the, the uh, whole message of, of the gospel and of God's revelation is the promise of new creation. It's the promise that totally eclipses the, the dreams of utopia that Sir Thomas More had, More had when he wrote his famous book, Utopia the dream of this place being a better world. It goes beyond the dreams of politicians and their empty promises. It goes beyond the dreams of that couple who won massive amounts on the lottery this past week and made headlines. They'll very quickly discover that such a vast amount of money becomes a nightmare, not a dream come true. As the hymn writer says, solid joys, lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. But it's all summed up in the words of Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. But more than that, it puts a completely different complexion on what it means to be a Christian. To be a child of God, to be, have faith in Jesus Christ, because the Apostle Paul tells the, Christians, tells the Christians in Corinth, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, new creation. We've already begun to experience the renewal, the transformation. That is a foretaste of the world to come. That will be perfected the moment that we rise from the dead when Jesus comes and calls us home. But then lastly, we're not left without hope of future salvation. Verse 24. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. After the expulsion, a guard is placed at the entrance to the garden. Again, it's something that could be easily misconstrued and seen only 
in terms of everlasting exclusion from this paradise that God had made and God had given to the first pair. But that doesn't reflect the wording, the precise wording of this verse before us. The cherubim are set in place not to prevent people getting back to the tree of life, but to guard the way to the tree of life. And that's significant. Yes, there is a temporary exclusion, but the way is guarded that there is a passage that can come back and nobody, not even the devil himself, can block that way. It's borne out by the choice of the guards that God placed there. Cherubim, it's Horatius Bonner, who says the mention of cherubim in the Old Testament um, always relates to man and his redemption. Here was God putting agents of redemption in place to say there's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open and all may go in. And the rest of the message of the Bible is the story of how God secured that and the God is on, how God has honoured his promise as he guards the way back to paradise. In the picture language of tabernacle and temple is the entrance into the Holy of Holies. Once a year, and only with sacrificial blood, the high priest was allowed to enter that most holy place on behalf of the people, a taste of paradise. But it's the Lord Jesus Christ who, through his finished work upon the cross, cries out in triumph, it is accomplished. The way is secured, the door is opened. Whoever believes in me shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. God has not left our race hopeless in this fallen world. He reminds us that there is a way back to the paradise that he has given. There's no accident that the Bible not only begins in a garden, but it ends in a garden. It doesn't only begin with a reference to the tree of life as the key to our deepest fulfillment, but it ends in Revelation 22 and verse 2 with a reference to the tree of life, which is in that glory of the world to come. And it's not just life that is never ending. It's life to the full. It is abundant life. It's life the way that God intends it. The whole point of the message of the Bible is that we are led to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And in him, we find ourselves in paradise. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for, again, this glimpse you've given from the very beginning of your revelation to how things were, what went wrong. But even in the midst of that tragedy, what you, on your own initiative, did to put things right. We thank you, Lord, that in your sovereign will and purpose, not only did you decree the fall, but you decreed redemption. And we thank you that Adam and Eve tasted that by your provision, albeit in a provisional way. The death of two animals for the covering of their sin and shame, but pointing to the death of your son and the way that his blood cleanses us from all our sin and guarantees us a place in the glory of that garden that you're preparing for all your people. Amen.